So welcome everybody to this uh, month uh, Fong lecture. Um, just as a, a bit of introduction about these Fong lectures, uh, we are started organizing um, this series uh, with honor of Vicky Fong, that was a founding member of the International Biogeography Society and as well the fourth International Biogeography Society president. Um, with these uh, Fong lectures, what we want is having this opportunity to gather all of us interested in biogeography once every month as just as a reminder, it's free. And this is all done uh, to promote a little bit more biogeography international and giving uh, as well the opportunity to the, all, all these amazing biogeographers that, that are around the world to present their research. And today's uh, research uh, is uh, Janavi Joshi research. Uh, Janavi is a, an assistant professor at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in Hyderabad, India. And she's going to present uh, her work on the centipedes uh, based mainly in the Western Ghats, India. Her research and her interest is uh, systematic historical biogeography with a very strong focus on tropical environments, but as well on arth arthropods. Uh, so I will leave now Joshi uh, Janavi to explain her research. And then please um, just write questions as well if you want at the very while she's speaking. Thank you. Can you see it now? Yes, brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for the nice introduction, Sandra. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to participate in the Funk Lecture Series. And I would like to thank the organizers of this series and the International Biogeography Society for inviting me. Uh, we are a very young group based out of Hyderabad, as Sandra said, in South India. And our main research focus is on studying systematics, biogeography, and community assembly in using phylogenetic framework in tropical forest. So Vicky Funk, in whose memory this lecture series has been organized, was a field evolutionary biologist and who championed collection-based evolutionary systematics and biogeography, and particularly historical biogeography. And my research treats on the same path set by Vicky Funk, and it's a great honor for me to give this talk in this series. So more than two centuries, biogeographers are exploring species distribution patterns and underlying processes which influence those patterns. And Skeletor Wallace identified these different biogeographic regions based on the distribution of the species. And this is a map which shows six different biogeographic realms. And one of the most striking pattern which emerged from looking at species distribution patterns is the tropical forests consistently have higher diversity. And this has attracted many researchers to ask very fundamental questions. What drives the tropical diversity and how it's maintained over time? Uh, one can think of the explanation to explain how tropical diversity can be categorized into two uh, broad categories, either into geoclimatic, geographical factors or ecological factors. One of the oldest explanation was it's an old biome. It's a much more stable biome, so you have a gradual species increase, but it's coupled with a low extinction rate. Uh, it could be also because of multiple geoclimatic or geographic factors, like geographic barriers, tectonic movement, sea level changes, also the volcanic activity. And when we think about ecological factors, it could be biotic or abiotic, deep or steep climatic topographical gradients, habitat heterogeneity, high productivity, which leads to high diversity. And there have been many areas within the tropical uh, forest, like Amazonian rainforest or neotropical rainforest, which have been extensively studied to understand what is the role of geoclimatic, biogeographic, and ecological processes to shape the diversity in these forests. Also, Madagascar, which is a continental island, has also been extensively studied to understand the relative roles of historical and ecological factors shaping the diversity patterns in these landscapes. Today, what I'm going to talk about is one of one such area in the tropical forest is known as Western Ghats. Uh, it's a continuous chain of mountains which runs parallel to the west coast of India. And along with Sri Lanka, it's been identified as one of the global biodiversity hotspots. And it's because of its high diversity, but as well as high endemicity. Uh, and these uh, forests are located in this mountain chain, which is a form of geographically or topographically a very complex landscape. Uh, this map here shows you the elevation gradient, which is around 50 meters to up to 2,500 meters. 
and as one moves from south to north the rainfall decreases and this has an effect on uh, dry period length so in the southern areas uh, the dry period length is much more smaller as one moves north it increases and southern areas are more climatically much more stable as one moves north they become more seasonal and this rainfall pattern is also very and elevation is very tightly linked with temperature so you have high elevation areas which are much more cooler but low and mid elevation areas which are much warmer and both these topographic and climatic gradients has also been translated in the kind of habitat diversity we see there you have wet forest you have shola and grassland mosaic you have dry forest you have deciduous forest you also have these something like a unique ecosystems which are these lateritic plateaus these are table lands which are surrounded by a stunted evergreen forest but apart from habitat and climatic and topographic heterogeneity western ghats are also part of something called peninsular india and which was part of gondwana landmass and in terms of biogeography some of the most interesting ancient patterns are associated with the breakup of gondwana and which imposed the isolation on previously connected landmass so this peninsular india which is shown here in the red circle uh first separated from the african plate then from antarctica australian plate and finally from madagascar and seychelles and then collided with asia and it's one of the landmass which traveled the most in the history and as a result what you have today in the western ghats which could be the gondwanan elements which were on this drifting landmass or species which have colonized uh, western ghats or peninsular india after india collided with eurasia so you could have african elements eurasian elements southern chinese elements or southeast asian taxa coming and colonizing peninsular indian plate so when i started working on biogeography one of the first question we asked is what is the evolutionary origin of western ghats biota and to address this question i chose a soil orthropod group uh, centipedes class uh, chilopoda so i particularly worked uh, most have done most of my work on one particular family these are known as colopendrid centipedes and they form one of the most ancient lineages among terrestrial orthropods they have more than 420 million years of fossil history they are nocturnal predatory solitary animals they are terrestrial in nature they are distributed almost all the continents except antarctica and they also have a very low dispersal ability which makes them an interesting model system for biogeographic studies so to address the first question what is the evolutionary origins of western ghats biota what we did is sample these species extensively in the western ghats of the entire family scolopendridae we generated dna data we built phylogenetic trees and we calibrated those trees using fossils and what we showed that when you look at this family with of multiple genera that this gray bar indicates the cretaceous period and most of the genera on the peninsular indian plate had started diversifying in the late cretaceous so suggesting that we have most likely putative gondwanan origin and i continued to work on this group and now we have many more taxa from across the globe representing almost around half of the species diversity and what you could see here all the red uh, branches marked in red here in this phylogeny are all from the taxa from uh, peninsular india and they started diversifying in the late cretaceous and all their sister groups are from former gondwanan continents and this kind of confirms that most of them have a cretaceous diversification or origin in the western ghats and their sister groups are in former gondwanan fragments and this brings us to then the second part like what's the role then vicarians and long distance dispersal in shaping their biogeography and when we again looked at uh, these two processes one can think about when the gondwana fragmentation happened does that correspond with the what we see in the phylogeny and we can use historical biogeography analysis to figure out if the breaking events correspond with the phylogenetic break or is it more of a long distance dispersal or multiple dispersal events which have shaped the history of these biota uh, very recently karinth actually uh, looked at many uh, extant tetrapods from peninsular india and showed that it's not the gondwanan breakup but many taxa 
largely herpetofauna lineages have come into India in the Paleogene, which is in the last 50-55 million years ago, including mammals, birds, and many amphibians. Interestingly, there were two groups, Sicilian and blind snakes, which had their basal divergences in the Cretaceous. When we look at plants, what's the evidence there? They've all started diversifying or come into India in the last 25 million years. But when we look at more orthropods, which is the work which I did on butterflies also on spiders, you see again, they have started to come into India and the species are much younger because of dispersal events or they are in paleogene. But when we look at now soil orthropods, our work on centipedes and our other work on scorpions and beetles, almost all genus level basal divergences are in the Cretaceous. So what's the common uh, characteristics among all these uh, taxa? Sicilian, centipedes, beetle, blind snake, scorpions, they all live in soil and sometimes they hibernate. So maybe the fossorial nature is something has meant, like allowed them to persist for a long time. And these are the ancient lineages where we see the Gondwana breakup events have shaped their history. And we need to look at many such lineages now to understand what is the role of Gondwana breakup events in shaping the biogeographic history of these taxa. But once we knew this, that okay, at least all the centipedes we are studying are Gondwana in origin, and you do have other taxa which have the equally ancient divergences, then the next question was how after uh, being on the peninsular Indian plate in the Western Ghats, how are they diversified? What are the geological or ecological processes which might have shaped their distribution patterns in the Western Ghats? And as I have mentioned earlier in my talk, the kind of broad categories of processes which are in either geoclimatic process, barriers, or ecological factors. So when we think about Western Ghats and its forest, these are the processes which felt that are more important, which will drive the distribution patterns in the Western Ghats. So one of the geological process which might have had the most impact on the Western Ghats is the Deccan Trap Volcanism, which happened around 65 million years ago. And that may have had a, a stronger impact on the diversity what we see today in the Western Ghats. Apart from that, you have multiple biogeographic barriers. Geographic barriers are like gaps, which could uh, hinder the taxa movement or the ecological factors such as climatic and topographic gradients and species could show non-random assemblages on that. And I'll take a few minutes to explain what do I mean by these three scenarios. So southern parts of the Western Ghats weren't really affected by the Deccan Trap volcanism. We knew that peninsular India was dominated by the wet tropical climate in the Cretaceous before the volcanic activity happened. Then there was a massive volcanic activity around 65 million years ago which led to species extinctions, including di dinosaurs, but also associated with the drastic climate changes. And this is the kind of a map which shows the e present extent of the Deccan volcanic province. And this is based on the Foramina Ferra samples. And you could see that much more the northern and the central parts of the Western Ghats were affected by this Deccan track volcanic activity, but the southern parts remained much more stable. We also have now some evidence from isotope and pollen analysis that it was the re-establishment of wet climate happened around Paleogene, around uh, 50 million years. So there is a possibility that the southern areas, which were not affected by the De uh, Deccan Trap volcanic activity, could act as a refuge for a species. And then once the climate was favorable, species could have dispersed again in the southern and northern areas. Uh, so we proposed, uh, I predicted this in a phylogenetic framework. So this is the Western Ghats. You can think about it's divided into three distinct zones. The Southern Western Ghats, you have Nilgiris here, then the Central Western Ghats and Northern Western Ghats. And if the Southern Western Ghats indeed was a refuge, what would one expect is that it's ancestral area. You have many more species in the Southern Western Ghats because that's the time for more speciation. It's the older and stable area. And you have species from Northern and Central Western Ghats, which are nested within the Southern Western Ghats. Then we looked at our second hypothesis. Do phylogenetic breaks actually correspond with these biogeographic breaks? And in the case of Western Ghats, we have one of the main biogeographic barrier, which is known as a Palaghat Gap. It's a 30 kilometer wide 
uh, valley which separates the western ghats into two blocks and it, this is the main biogeographic barrier which hinders the saxa movement which would reflect in having two groups across the barrier you will have one clade which is the south of palaghat gap and one which is on the north of palaghat gap and our third scenario was if species are actually responding to the local climatic conditions because as i mentioned earlier there is also a strong climatic gradient as one moves from south to north you have much more rainfall here much more stable environment in the southern parts as one moves to the north the seasonality increases and if you have species which are adapted to these local climatic conditions then what you will have is this non random species assemblage reflecting in their phylogeny as well so we had these three scenarios and their phylogenetic predictions to test using our ancient taxa where we had established that they are indeed gonon and taxa and started diversifying in the late cretaceous in peninsular india so we went ahead and tested all these three scenarios using centipedes as a model system and i must admit that these scenarios need not be all mutually exclusive you could have two scenarios operating at the same time but to do that what we needed is a species level hypothesis to test and like any orthropod soil orthropod group centipedes in the western ghats weren't very well studied so our first task was to get species identity in place the species hypothesis in place so we used integrative systematic approach we collected the samples extensively in western ghats as well as in peninsular india we then generated molecular data we used multiple species delimitation methods we looked at their morphology we looked at the climatic niche in which these species occur are pre currently present and then we reconciled the evidence from morphology molecules and their climatic niche to propose a species hypothesis for multiple groups in this scolopendrid family and what we have now is that three distinct lineages uh, these are three distinct genera pithecostigmus rhizida and digitipus and we know the species limits in each of these genus we have a robust species hypothesis for all these three genera from the western ghats and now we we going to use these to test all the three hypotheses which we have proposed to explain their distribution patterns in western ghats so i'll uh, start with the genus digitipus uh, this genus is globally distributed in the congo basin in africa in the western ghats when i started my work but now we have a species which has recently been described in southeast asian forest as well so looks like it's a tropical group and occurs in the wet tropical forest and we have nine species uh currently in this group and when we did biogeography analysis historical biogeography analysis on this group as you can see that southern western ghats which is depicted in red here in alphabet a came as a one of the ancestral areas for this particular group and there were two dispersal events one to the northern and one in the central western ghats but interestingly one also to the southeast asia and that happened post collision event as well as the dispersal event which were in the central and northern western ghats were post volcanic activity so this kind of suggests that southern western ghats could have acted as a refuge for the digitipus species during the cretaceous volcanic activity and then i'll show you the evidence from the another group which is the genus ethostigmus here we found its endemic radiation in peninsular india you have four species in the western ghats and one in the eastern ghats but again in eastern ghats which is a a uh, much more broken chain of mountains on the east coast but the some mountain tops have a wet forest so this is in the one of the wet forest mountain tops is where we found another endemic species of ethmostigmus and when you look at this is the endemic radiation of five species in peninsular india and when we performed the historical biogeography analysis for surprise southern western ghats were again uh came as ancestral area for this particular group and you had a dispersal events not only into the central and northern but also the wet forest in the eastern ghats which is happened in the last 30 to 40 million years suggesting that southern western ghats <clears throat> might have acted again as a refuge for these taxa then we looked at third group which is genus rhizida and it was much more complicated than these two groups this has a pan tropical distribution which means it has a distribution all the way from south america to australia and when you have such a wide distributions invariably one has to be very careful what you are calling it and it turns out that rhizida what we were referring to is a paraphyletic group 
but most of the indian uh, species of peninsular indian tax are as part of this particular clade so we focused on this clade we again delimited the species in this particular group and we when we performed the biogeographic analysis what we found that peninsular india comes as an ancestral area we didn't do it at the western ghat scale we are yet to perform that analysis but it showed that southern uh, southeast asian species again are well nested within the peninsular indian clade but this group also has started diversifying post uh, volcanic activity in the western ghats and peninsular india to summarize what we have found in these three groups uh, this is the lineage through time plot on the x axis is time and on the y axis what you see is the number of species or lineages and i have marked two things when the volcanic activity happened which is this dashed line and another one which is peninsular india colliding with eurasia which is around 50 55 million years ago and what we can see definitely from these three groups is that southern western ghats did seem like work or acted as a refuge for these groups by palagat gap didn't uh, come across as a biogeographic barrier as when we are understanding the lineage history or diversification patterns uh, but in case of ichthyostigmus we also had a species unique to each of the sub regions within the western ghats suggesting that you have only one species in each of the biogeographic sub regions and you don't have multiple species suggesting it could be has a unique species in each of the sub regions uh, also we found there are endemic radiations suggesting there is in situ speciation happening you have older lineages which have more species in digitiferous southern western ghats is much more diverse as compared to the central and northern suggesting maybe there is some evidence for time for speciation older areas have more species as compared to the younger uh, or unstable areas and interestingly what we have is the gondwan and vicarians has shaped the early history of lineage diversification and more dispersal events in the later part of the lineage biogeographic history and so so far this is the story using scolopendrid centipedes as a model system but very recently there is a paper on scorpions which also use a similar habitat in the western ghats and it's not only the new species now what we uh, what it, what they found is actually three new genera so this is a genus called heteromeres which is distributed in from peninsular india all the way to southeast asia and in after the systematic revision of this group what they found is that all the three genera which present in the uh, indian subcontinent and in the western ghats are endemic and their biogeographic analysis again suggests that along with the sri lanka and southern parts of the western ghats are the ancestral areas and their early history is again uh, influenced by gondwana and vicarian event and the later lineage history is due to dispersal events so this brings us to a very interesting scenario what's happening with the scolopendrids in sri lanka are they also showing a similar pattern and currently one of the undergraduate student from sri lanka is working on this and based on the morphology of these groups which we have studied so far we think that ichthyostigmus and rhizida will be very well nested but ichthyostigmus morphologically is much more closer to papua new guinea and australian specimens so we are waiting to see what sort of biogeographic patterns do we see with the sri lankan groups and so far i've been talking about how these species have come into being like how have they diversified in the western ghats but if you look at the similar species from a community perspective now how have they uh, form a community in the western ghats i would like to spend a couple more minutes on that so we asked a question like how is the diversity of centipedes in the western ghats what sort of distribution of these centipedes in the western ghats do they uh, show that one of our expectation from southern western ghat uh, refuge hypothesis that southern western ghat should have more species and as one moves towards north the diversity should decrease and this is also consistent with latitudinal diversity gradient hypothesis where you have more diversity at lower latitudes and higher latitudes the diversity diversity should decrease so do we see that pattern when we look at all these species together and think about scolopendrid centipedes as a community which occurs in the western ghats as i mentioned earlier the western ghats is one of the global biodiversity hotspot but do we have hotspots within hotspots are there areas where you have disproportionately high diversity 
And what sort of patterns do we see in phylogenetic uh, species turnover within the Western Ghats? And to do this, we again went back to our species hypotheses, which are there for these three genera. The approach we took is that we built a species distribution models based on world-plane bioclimatic data, which are the derivatives of precipitation and temperature. We used our species dated time tree and calculated multiple phylogenetic diversity, taxonomic diversity indices. We also looked at the patterns of endemism to understand what sort of diversity and endemism patterns recent equals show in the Western Ghats. So when you just look at the diversity gradients, uh, on the left, you have the Western Ghats and its subdivisions, Northern, Central, Middle East, and Southern Western Ghats. And the two maps here depict taxonomic diversity and a phylogenetic diversity, which shows that Southern areas are indeed more diverse. You have more diversity in Southern Western Ghats, and as one moves towards North, the diversity decreases. And it's consistent with both Southern Western Ghats as a refuge hypothesis, as well as latitudinal diversity gradient hypothesis. And we don't have much of a difference between the taxonomic and phylogenetic uh, diversity indices. And this attributes to the fact that our taxonomic diversity, our understanding of taxonomy in this group is also influenced by phylogeny. All our species are also phylogenetically, with the phylogenetic data, they are being delimited. So we have a very consistent pattern, both taxonomic diversity and phylogenetic diversity. Then we looked at patterns of endemism to identify if there are any hotspots within this uh, global biodiversity hotspot. And interestingly, what we found that not only the Southern Western Ghats, which was expected to have uh, come up as one of the high diversity hotspots, but you also have areas in the Northern Western Ghats, which came up as high diverse areas or rather high endemicity values. Uh, and this is interesting because you have uh, from the high diversity and endemism along with the presence of ancient lineages, which was expected in the Southern Western Ghats, but Northern Western Ghats also has these range restricted species, which are very unique. And why is it important in the context of Western Ghats? Because if you look at uh, the protected area network, Southern parts are much more well protected in terms of its national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, but the Northern parts, which are these large lateratic plateaus uh, still need uh, much better planning in terms of protected area network. And the species which occur here are also range restricted. They occur only in these plateaus and surrounding areas. And these are characterized with high seasonal environments, poor soil conditions. So it would be interesting now to see the species which occur here also have some kind of unique adaptation to survive in these landscapes. The environments are quite harsh. When I say it's harsh, it means in the summer, it's really dry. You have no water whatsoever in the landscape. But in the monsoon, most of these places will be actually filled with water. So you'll have smaller water pools. And it looks a very uh, different in the monsoon. And it's ephemeral vegetation, which is you can see it on the left side here. And in the summer, it's completely dry. So what sort of unique adaptations these range restricted species show here is something one needs to look at. And also these plateaus kind of needs to be now looked at. If at all you have a species, how widely distributed they are or they are endemic to these unique landscapes. And the third thing, the third question was, what sort of patterns of turnover do we see? And this is very interesting, which was kind of a surprise to us. Because we, when we looked at individual lineages of all the three genera in scolopendrate centipedes, we didn't see Palkat gap acting as a biogeographic barrier for their diversification. But here, when you look at species turnover, what you have is a unique community across the barrier. These are the Sorensen and Phyllosorensen indexes, which are shown here. You have a very unique diversity in the Southern Western Ghats, a unique community. And there is another community which is actually contiguous with central and northern. So now we're interested to think about what is driving this community pattern. Is it climatic barriers or a biogeographic barriers? And it will be interesting to see which contributes to this community that uh, picture. So with this, what we tried to show that both diversity and endemism patterns are related to geological and climatic gradients, which uh, occurred in the Western Ghats, but also the Southern Western Ghats, which are important to in terms of conservation value, because you have many lineages which are range restricted, and ancient lineages show in situ speciation, but also we have unique lineages, again range restricted in the Northern parts. 
And this now needs to be looked at across taxa. The framework can be adopted to other taxa, which are much more diverse as well, to look at what sort of diversity pattern do we see and what are their drivers of those diversity gradients. Uh, so in the future, what we are planning to do now to look at multiple soil arthropod groups across the Western Ghats and use a comparative framework where these arthropods would vary in terms of their life history traits, ecology, morphology, and even species richness, distribution ranges, and then try and get a more synthetic picture. What sort of uh, diversity gradients do these soil arthropods show? And what's the role of geoclimatic events and ecological factors in shaping these diversity patterns? We'll also look at individual lineage level diversification patterns, but we'll also look at more from a community ecology perspective. And I've been talking about, again, at a much larger scale of a Western Ghats, which is around 1,600 uh, kilometer. But uh, we are also started looking at what happens when we just look at species pairs, which could be only in the Southern Western Ghat or it could be in the Central Western Ghats. So moving away from macro patterns to micro patterns and trying to understand what are the drivers at species level, what sort of uh, traits on which these species must be diverging from one another. Because most of our work showed that these species are old lineages, but they're not accompanied by extensive morphological diversification. They are, their body plan seems like it's very similar. You can't even tease apart two sister species from one another. So then what are these axes on which these species could have diverged? And being the predatory arthropods, we thought that diet and venom would have been the axis on which these species must be diversified. So we have picked up multiple species pairs on the gradient of uh, allopatric distribution, sympatric distribution, are they habitat specific or a generalist? At what time in the evolutionary past have they diverged from one another? Or also morphologically cryptic, or there are some diagnostic characters we can use to tease apart these species. And currently, we are trying to understand what's the role of the diet and venom. So another hypothesis that may not be its diet and venom, but those species show a very distinct venom and diet both. Because if you have change in the venom, should translate in opportunity of a new niche, of a new diet, species could explore that. Or is it the similar venom composition allows you to access anyway a different dietary niche, or your diet changes but venom has diverged because of other factors. So we're in the process of looking at these two traits across species pairs and then try and link those traits also at a macro scale. But right now we are looking at a species pairs level. Just to end my talk before, uh, thank you. I started saying that it's a great honor to present this work in the, uh, this lecture series of Wikifunk, which is named after Wikifunk. And one of the great contribution of Wikifunk was this fascinating book on the hyperdiverse plant family composity or asteraceae. And I draw a lot of inspiration from this work. And I hope that sometime, sometime in the future, we'll be able to say that about scolopendric centipedes as a family, that what sort of evolutionary paradigms they have faced and biogeographic uh, stories they have to tell us. And before I end my talk, I would like to thank my PhD mentor, postdoc mentor, and a postdoc who has worked with me for the past one year. Uh, this entire work was done uh, with them, Praveen Karan, Greg H. Bohm, and Bharti. So thank you to them. And these are the multiple funding agencies who have supported our work over the years. So thank you to all of them. And thank you all for patiently listening to this talk. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Janavi. That was a great talk. I think that now is time for questions, David. Yeah, so as we mentioned before, you can write the question in the QA box or you can raise your hand and ask the question. A colleague that has raised the hand, who's Yanil Kumar? Hello, uh, just for a minute, I'm just starting my video. Hello, Dr. Joshi. That was a very great talk. And thank you for that talk. So I got a question. Uh, this is like, uh, is the endemicity of the centipedes related to the floral endemicity, which is scattered and based on the floral studies, as we know, uh, Western girls have a scattered endemism. So is the endemicity of centipedes related to that? Did you find some? Frankly, I haven't looked at. It's a great question. I will definitely look at now. 
I, I don't know if it's related to that. We did use some of the soil layers to look at the distribution patterns, but these were very broad classification of rock types. Ah, okay. And I got one more question. Uh, did you, as you told, there were hotspots within hotspots. So in the Southern Western Guards, I would like to know if there was any hotspot. Did you feel like, based on your data set, did you feel like there was hotspots within the hotspot? Like if the Southern end of the Southern Western Guards, where we had a gap, did you feel something sure. like that? Yes. No. So there is a very interesting question. There is also one of the biogeographic barriers within the Southern Western Ghats. No, there's a Sengota gap. It's a very small gap. If the forest is contiguous, we didn't see any evidence for that. But maybe because of we don't have species which are that smaller scale, where the distribution is only of south or north of Sengota gap. Most of the species were from across the mountain ranges in the Southern Western Ghats. Okay, and I got one more question. Uh, so it's like, um, based on the protected areas, did you find any unique assemblages according to the protected areas where like the wide num amount of widespread species was lesser or there were more endemicity associated with any particular protected area, something like that? Mm, frankly, no. And we haven't done the quantitative analysis to look at that, the <laughs> overlaying the maps of protected areas. But uh, from my experience, I can say uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think that there will be such uh, reason to believe that. As long as you have a habitat either in the protected area or outside, uh, I think the species could potentially present. It's to do with the habitat quality. And invariably, as you are asking, the protected areas have a better habitat, which is remained inside the forest. Mm -hmm. But we haven't quantified which are the species which are under protected areas and which are outside and look at the habitat parameters if it does change. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you for answering all the questions. I wish you all the best. Thank Thanks. you. We'll have more questions in the Q&A box. Uh, one of them is from Trevor Price. Trevor would like to see if you have observed some divergences within a species and if they can be related to more recent geological events, mainly Pleistocene events. Uh, Great question. No, we haven't. So some of the species for which we had uh, population level data also showed the divergences which were 5 to 10 million year old. We didn't see much in the Pleistocene. But currently we are looking at individual species and uh, populations. Right now, because my phylogenetic work with maximum sample size for a species was 30 to 35 individuals across the Ghats. But now we are looking at population level and we'll see if we have any divergences which are much more recent at the population level. But so far, what we have detected across populations haven't been anything in the place to see. Thank you. Another question from the Q&A box is from Hayden Murray, and he's asking about what role do you think the edaphic life history plays in speciation? See, soil types and the soil parameters would definitely play an important role, but how do they play? Is it through diet? What they support other biodiversity on those soil types? Or there are some unique morphological adaptations is something we don't know. So we are going to look at diet, if that also changes along with the edaphic factors and species use or partition or use resources differently. But uh, I can't directly think about how the soil type or the soil itself would influence a speciation per se. Other colleague has raised a hand, Servan Proches. Especially I enjoy the, the part about um, soil organisms showing these interesting patterns because many studies that I've been involved in, we're looking at, uh, at uh, angiosperms, we're looking at tetrapod vertebrates and so on. And these are things that move around, eh, most of them. But it's, it's really great to look at the, the small stuff in the soil and find that these are the things that have been hanging around in one specific place for a long time. Eh? Um, but what I wanted to ask you is, because you mentioned Sicilians, um, and I know um, you guys had a massive discovery in, in India, the family Chikilidae, which is a, a brand new family. And basically, if you split tetrapods into 10, that's one of those 10. It's, it's, it's like a massive discovery. 
So that that was in the East eh? So that was in the in the Eastern states, whatever you you, you call. I believe you called it the the, the Tikkan part of India, the Eastern provinces. So did you do any sampling in in Meghalaya, Nagaland, Manipur? No, I haven't really sampled in Northeast India at all, and that's something is one needs to sample now. And I had one ethnostigma species from Northeast, and it's unresolved currently in the phylogeny. Oh. Uh, uh, it's very distinct from the peninsular Indian radiation. And uh, even in the Raisida group, we had one species. Again, it was a new species, and uh, it's again unresolved in the current phylogeny. So I think we really need to go and sample very systematically to Northeast India and think about where, where will they go in, in the phylogeny. So if we think about these are the ancient animals which have a Gondwanan history, either uh, as we have Southeast Asian species moving from Peninsular India and dispersing into Southeast Asia, I would uh, expect that Northeast fauna could also evolve from Peninsular Indian. Uh, plate and we'll have a multiple dispersal events to Northeast India, but uh, we don't know that yet. And I haven't sampled Northeast India at all. And that's on the cards, but it's going to take longer than expected. We really don't have any data from Northeast India at the moment. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, David, you are on the mute. All right. We'll have other questions in the Q&A. Now, David Baines is, ask, is saying, great talk, Janavi. Uh, do you know how centipedes ranges are affected by human infrastructure, such as roads and railways? It's always negative or they can help the distribution of those species? Exactly, I don't know, but one can guess that uh, if you are a specialist species, maybe uh, it would get negatively affected. But frankly, we have currently all our distribution and point locations are in the forested area. We haven't really started sampling in the urban landscapes but my guess is uh, that the generally species which you see on campuses in the urban cities may not get affected so much but the specialist species might get affected but that data is still emerging so it's hard to thank you we have other question from trevor price trevor would like to know if you connect the diversification to the Deccan traps, I was wondering if that means on the other continents there was not the same effect, or if the asteroid impact was important as well, and hence was more global. Great questions. Yes, I think it's possible. It's that uh, right now we don't have a lineage level diversification data from the other landmass. We have uh, we are generating right now for two groups in Australia. So hopefully we can say something about it soon, but from other like Africa or South America, we have no data at a lineage level, like how the diversification happened in individual lineages. So, but yeah, one would suspect, I think both the contract volcanism and the drastic climate change which followed had much more impact in the Western world. I have a question myself and I'm gonna use <laughs> to ask you straight here, right? In, yeah. So I can see that many of these species are really old, right? And there is yes. no events on the on speciation. But even even within these old species, are you aware if in the lower parts of the mountain range, in comparison to the higher parts of the mountain ranges, you observe some cluster there where the really old endemics are maybe in the upper parts and not in the lower parts or it's the other way around. The upper parts have the species which occur in the high elevation areas are nested in the low and mid elevation species. So invariably in across all the three lineages, high elevation species are well nested within the low and mid elevation species. So in the Western Ghats, it's kind of different. So your high elevation areas have the Shola grassland mosaic, which is a grassland and you have a forest in the valleys. And one of the hypotheses is that these ecosystems are much more younger as compared to the low and mid elevation forest. So even people when they've studied plants and angiosperms, they think it's all elements which have come from Himalayas and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. It's frost limits. Yeah. 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 And in my data, but what you're asking is correct. In frogs, uh, they have found out the way around because the younger lineages, the mountain forests have been the Older lineages and the low and mid elevation where the nested. 
That brings me to the next question, and I'm, I'm sorry to abuse of my position here, <laughs> the co-host, but I feel really curious, right? I mean, yeah. you have been talking about this aspect now, but at the, at the same time, right, the West Ghats are really big mountain range, and I wonder how many species you think are undercover? How, how, how many species are there that we don't even know? Uh, exactly, when I started my work, in each group, we have now doubled the diversity. And if that's the correct way of resampling, I'm guessing there's still a lot of diversity which is undiscovered. So the approach I took to sample is that I went and sampled each of individual mountain range in the Western Ghats. So you have distinct mountain ranges which go all the way from uh, eight degree in the south to 16. And each mountain range at low, high, mid elevation is how we have done sampling. So, but this is the first pass. And if my, uh, for our diversity estimates where we started, we knew three or four species in each of the genus, and now we have eight to nine. So it, individually in each group, we have doubled the diversity. So given this, quite a bit of diversity is still underestimated. So we, we are now planning to use some of the metabarcoding and metagenomic approaches to look at the diversity. Hopefully that would give us much more accurate picture. So this is the direction in which you are moving your research, trying to use yes. metagenomics. Meta, uh, yes. Maybe yes. population level analysis. To try to yes, hoping, yes, we can get that entire spectrum of looking at population level as well as phylogenetics. Thank you, Yonavi. Yeah, yeah. Do we have more questions for the speaker today? We are only eight minutes to go to before, so we are getting close to uh, the time when we will need to close down. So maybe it might be time for one or two questions. I just would like to, to read uh, the different comments on the chat. I'm going to show okay. for, for her because there are very nice comments here. So Mark Hughes says, wonderful biogeography, fascinating insight into the gods. Thank you. Um, and then as well, there is another one for, from Hazel Gordon that says, wonderful comprehensive talk that allowed me to better appreciate the journey of the sentiments. So I thought that these are very nice comments <laughs> for you. Thank you. I have a, yeah. a, a question, but it's not, it's a kind of tangential question as well. From all your research in, in the GATS, um, do you think that there is any point in particular that could be interesting for conservation? Region. No, yes, so interesting question. So currently, if you just look at the uh, protected area network, so in India, what we have is national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, where you have a protection which is imposed by either state government or the central government. So that is much more covered in the southern parts, but the northern parts are not very well covered. And it's also to do with the uh, kind of forest they have. So you don't have this tall evergreen forest. What you have is a stunted evergreen forest and also these table lands of plateaus, which are grasses. So the, which needs now much more attention. And these are also the areas where you will have more threats. So really? we need much more endemicity analysis now in the guards as well. And of course it uh, extends to peninsular India where you have much more extensive grasslands, which are currently not under protection. So there it's much more clear. But within the guts, you will have the northern areas to think about, but the larger areas as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, before we close, and we just got, oh, there is another question and answer, I think. Oh, yeah. A lot of people saying thank you and great talk for you. And before we close um, the session, uh, there's another comment for you from Darko Kotoras that says, amazing work. I really like the predictions and the general conceptual framework. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so very, very nice um, uh, comments. And thank you all for, for the questions. Um, Karen, would you like to put uh, the final slide? Thank you. So just for ending this session, just as a reminder that uh, our next Fong lecture will be on Wednesday, March 31st, and will be by Greta Peckel from University of Tasmania in Australia. And we will jump from centipedes to distribution of marine coastal systems. Uh, well, the title is exactly climate-driven species redistribution in marine coastal systems. 
And then we have two more upcoming speakers on April 28th is Catherine Graham. Um, the, the talk will be linking patterns and processes across scales, a case study with neotropical hummingbirds. And then in May 26th, we have Jessica Vlois and she will be talking about spatial tem temporal patterns of species and community change in California's small mammals. And just as a ending um, point, we just thank you all for, your, uh, for attending this uh, lecture series and for asking all these questions. Uh, if you have any suggestion about speakers or um, a topic that you would like us to organize a phone lecture, please as well, uh, send an email. Uh, to the IBS uh, mailing list. And thank you always for all your participati participation in here. Thanks, Janavi. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Janavi. Thank you so much. Bye.